No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thank you so much for joining us for another edition of our program. And as always, I want to tell you what's coming your way on this edition of our program. We will begin, of course, as we always do, with our devotional time. And that devotional time consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of our scripture. And today we go back to that beautiful 119th Psalm. We've been visiting that Psalm periodically in our devotional times as we work our way through this longest chapter in the Bible. And today we're looking at verses 137 through 144, that paragraph there in this alphabetical psalm uh, consisting of those eight verses. So get your Bibles if you don't have them already and uh, be turning to Psalm 119. We'll begin there in just a moment with verse 137. And uh, our devotional time, of course, uh, consisting of that scripture reading, beautiful singing, then that brief study. And following our brief study in our devotional time, it is Be Ready Always. Roger Campbell returns, and uh, he's going to deal with this question. Which is more important, carrying out the right actions in worship or worshiping with the right attitude? Is it action or is it attitude. Is one more important than the other? Roger will tell us, as he always does, from the Word of God in that excellent segment. And then Mark Teske comes along with something, something to share. You know, a lot of times we hear people say, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I am. And uh, they don't say that in a very positive connotation. Well, Mark's going to deal with that in an excellent, excellent segment that you will not want to miss. And then it's our final segment. It's Have a Bible Question with Guy Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Here's today's question. For what purpose did the apostles impart miraculous gifts to others? For what purpose did those apostles who had the power to impart miraculous gifts to others, for what purpose did they do so? You will not want to miss the biblical answer, as always, to that question. Right now, let's go to Psalm 119 and read together verses 137 through 144, where the psalmist writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live.
We're back for the study portion of our devotional time, looking at that beautiful 119th Psalm, as we've been doing from time to time in our devotional time, and uh, the paragraph beginning with 137, verse 137. That's what we are looking at today. And of course, this beautiful Psalm, as we have often pointed out, exalts the Word of God in virtually every line. And verse 137, with which we begin, is no exception. Righteous are you, O Lord, the psalmist writes, and upright are your judgments. You know, the word judgments is one of the words used for the Word of God in describing it, as we have pointed out in times past. Then there's the word testimonies and uh, law. Uh, these various expressions, all describing the inspired Word of God, are used by the psalmist. Uh, some of them, uh, many of them used right here in this paragraph again. We drop down to verse 147. There we see uh, commandments. And we have the word law in this segment as well. But all of God's Word is righteous as God is righteous and upright are His judgments. They're absolutely pure, and they're absolutely true. Verse 138, Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. God's faithfulness is sure and complete. He will never, He will never let us down, nor will His Word. It is completely reliable. Now, as we pointed out many times from time to time, that word, uh, that word that we are amenable to is the New Testament, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the new covenant. And of course the psalmist, if David be the author, but the psalmist, whoever he was, and David is generally thought to be the author of this beautiful psalm, he lived under a different law, uh, the law of Moses. But the law of God has been His law in every dispensation, and pertinent to every dispensation and true and absolute as it is today under the new covenant. So there are statements the psalmist makes that are statements that transcend every, uh, every dispensation of time in terms of describing the truthfulness and the absolute inspiration and reliability of the Word of God. And for us today, we live under that new testimony. But in verse 139, listen to something the psalmist writes that's very important. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your word. There the psalmist depicts the attitude that the righteous follower of God and the righteous follower of His word will have toward the sin that surrounds us in whatever time we find ourselves, and certainly in the time in which we live today, who can deny that sin is permeating so many aspects, virtually every aspect of life, and the perversion of God's Word that is so prevalent in today's society, in this country, throughout the world for that matter, should trouble the true child of God. And that's what, that's what the psalmist is expressing here. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your word. You know, this reminds me of something that Peter wrote about, uh, about uh, Lot, who vexed his righteous soul from day to day with the unlawful deeds of Sodom, where he was living. In other words, he was deeply troubled by the sin that surrounded him. And right thinking people and righteous thinking people will be deeply troubled by the sin that surrounds us today. And we will do all that we can to be a light in a world that has been so terribly and deeply darkened by sin. And that's what that verse reminds me of, what Peter wrote about Lot in particular, and the application that we should make to our lives today. Now notice something here in the next verse. Your word, verse 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. You know, he doesn't just write, your word is pure. Your word is very pure. It is pure 
uh, to the greatest uh, degree. But you know, that reminds me of something too, and that is that we must make sure that we have uh, an accurate translation of that written word today. And there are some translations that are totally unreliable. Uh, they are translated supposedly on the basis of what's called dynamic equivalent, where they are not, um, where the translators were not uh, striving to translate literally or on a word for word basis, but basically giving the dynamic equivalent. That's not a translation. That can be more of a commentary. And there are translations that uh, are characterized in that way as more commentary, injecting the doctrines and the creeds of men into the text itself. But we need a good, reliable uh, translation. The old King James translation, certainly reliable. The new King James, which we use regularly here on Good News Today, a revision of that King James, the fifth revision of it through time, uh, is a a reliable translation, not translated on the basis of so-called dynamic equivalent, but, uh, but uh, truly uh, a reliable translation. So the word is very pure, and we have that word today when we have a good, accurate translation. Your word is very pure. Notice one verses, uh, one, verse 141, I am small and despised, the psalmist writes, yet I do not forget your precepts. And then he, let's drop down to verse 143, ties in with 141. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. You know, the psalmist here says, even in times of trouble and anguish, uh, even in those times, your word is my delight. It should be our delight in all times. You know, that trouble and anguish and and uh, still delighting in the Word reminds me of the apostles in Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. They departed from the council, the Sanhedrin there on that occasion, uh, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And then the next verse, verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They didn't let that persecution deter them from teaching and preaching Christ to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now in verse, uh, the latter part of verse 143, your commandments are my delights. Delight in the commandment despite distress. That's what the apostles did on the occasion about which we just read, and that's what any disciple of Christ should do today. Well, 144, the last verse of this paragraph, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Can we have understanding of the will, the Word of God? Well, indeed, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about by which, he's talking about the mystery that he wrote before in few words, the revealing of the gospel he's talking about, by which when you what? When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul said, you can understand my God knowledge by simply reading the inspired Word of God. Yes, we can understand. Well, that's all the time we have for our devotional time. Time now to join Roger Campbell for another Be Ready Always segment. If you believe the Bible then you believe that the God of heaven is worthy of our worship. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 95 and verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Now, a question that sometimes people ask is, well, which is more important? The action, what we do in worship, or our attitude? How would you answer that question? We know that the God of heaven, not only is He worthy of our worship, He's the only one who's worthy of our worship. On one occasion when the devil was tempting Jesus and tempted Jesus to bow down and worship Him, uh, Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve, Matthew 4 and verse number 10. But when it comes to how we worship, does our action matter? We know the very first example of worship we have in the Scriptures involved two brothers. You probably remember who they were. 
Cain and his younger brother Abel. And the Bible indicates that by faith, Abel offered a sacrifice which was pleasing to God. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. And the record in Genesis 4 says that God had respect unto Abel's offering. But when it came to the offering of Cain, God did not accept it. And so the very first example of worship in the Bible shows us that some worship is acceptable in God's sight, but some worship is not. Well, how important is the action? We think about two sons of Aaron. That means they would be the nephews of Moses. They were at Mount Sinai. They were priests. And when they made a sacrifice to God, the Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, that these two sons of Aaron, Abihu and Nadab, they offered fire which God had not commanded them. Well, if God did not command it, that is, if God did not authorize it, from where did they get the idea to use that type of fire? And the answer is, it came from their own mind. But their action, was God pleased? The answer is no. There are other examples in the Old Testament which show us that God was not pleased with His people when they did not do in worship what He wanted them to do. But what about under the New Covenant? Perhaps you recall a conversation that Jesus had with a woman from Samaria. We read in John chapter 4 and verse number 23 that Jesus said to that woman from Samaria, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Again, that's John 4 and verse 23. Now, part of God's desire for our worship is that we worship in truth. Well, what would that mean? That would be to worship according to truth, whatever that is. In John 17, we have a record of a prayer that Jesus prayed the night before his crucified. And as Jesus was speaking to his heavenly Father, he said these words that are found in John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so God's word is our standard of truth. And so any worship that's going to be offered to the God of heaven, if it's going to be in truth, it must be according to God's standard, that is, according to biblical teaching. Is our action, that is, what we do in worship, is that important? It sure is. Well, what about our attitude? In the book of Malachi, we read in chapter 1 that some of the Jews in Malachi's day they had an attitude that was not acceptable in God's sight. In Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, God said, A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? And God went on to explain. But here were Jewish people, not simply Jewish people, but priests who despised God's name. And some of the people were bringing animal sacrifices that were diseased and lame and blind. And God said, you know what? Take those things and offer those to your governor. They wouldn't, he wouldn't accept that. Well, neither will I. So their attitude was not what it needed to be. Remember what Jesus said? Worship in spirit. That is with the proper attitude from the heart with the proper focus. So which is most important, action or attitude? They're both essential. God wants us to do things according to his word and do it from the heart for his glory. I'm Roger Camp, and this has been Be Ready Always. Well, as Roger reminds us, John 4, 24 is a key passage, isn't it? God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit, that's attitude, and in truth, that's action. They are equally important. Our thanks to Roger Campbell. Coming up, it is Mark Teske. He has something to share, 
after we share some contact information with you. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. Please take advantage of that contact information we have just given you. Please enroll in our Bible correspondence course as literally hundreds have done. It's absolutely free, no obligation. We'd love to have you enroll. If you'd like to in, engage in some in-depth Bible study online, absolutely free, uh, the folks at Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, where God and Montgomery and Troy Spradlin are, um, who are a regular part of our program, you can do that uh, just by uh, checking them out online and take a course or more than one course. Also, Truth.fm has us 24-7 in our own internet radio station. So many ways to access good news today. Right now, it's Mark Teske, and he has something to share. Hello, friend. Got something I'd like to share with you. Have you ever heard someone give the excuse for their bad behavior by saying something like, well, that's just the way I am? Maybe they say things that hurt other people and excuse it by saying, well, that's just the way I am. Maybe they cheat on their spouse and try to justify it by saying, well, that's just the way that I am. Have you ever stopped to think about what that really means? Since we're all created by God, such a statement is really an indictment of God. In effect, when you say, that's just the way that I am, you're saying that God created you in such a way that you're incapable of keeping yourself from sin. Now, everyone's subject to temptation of some sort, but we're responsible for our own actions when we choose to give in to that temptation. God doesn't make you commit sin. It's something you choose for yourself. We need to stop trying to find excuses for our sin. Stop blaming God for your poor choices. Why don't we use that phrase a little differently and use it instead to glorify God? For instance, why are you so concerned about the welfare of others? Well, that's just the way I am. Why do you always go visit people who are in the hospital? That's just the way I am. Why do you always attend the services of the Lord's church? Because that's just the way I am. Why are you always telling people about Jesus? That's just the way I am. See what a difference that makes? Start making right decisions in their life and then share this with someone else. From Mark Teske, we move to have a Bible question with God in Montgomery and Troy and Spratt. Okay, Troy, I'm going to preface the question 
a little bit. Normally I just introduce it right away. Right. But I know brother Dearman already told the audience what it is, <laughs> but I want to preface it because a lot of people forget that it's only the apostles that were able to lay on uh, or pass on the spiritual gifts through the laying on of hands to That's others. Right. That's right. Uh, Paul refers to this to Timothy, encouraging him in second Timothy, not to neglect the gift that he received from him. Mm hmm and uh, uh, admonition is also given in the first epistle of that. Uh, but I think Acts 8 is probably a really good example because Philip in verse 5 went to the city of Samaria. The verses that follow, they obeyed the gospel. But it was actually the apostles that had to come in order to lay hands. They came so that they might lay hands on them, being Peter and John. To, and it says right there in verse 15 that they might receive the Holy Ghost. It's not something that was done without the laying on of the apostles' hands. A lot of people forget that. And, they will say, well, this person's a miracle worker. Well, no, they can't be because the apostles were the only ones that could do that uh, to, to bestow that gift on. Exactly, and that's such an important point. It, it, I mean, it's, it, a lot of people today just get confused. Exactly. So the question that comes in is off that principle that if the apostles were the ones to bestow that spiritual gift on people, then what or for what purpose did the apostles impart miraculous gifts to others? What was the reasoning behind it? Well, the Bible gives us the answer in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And so essentially, the reason they had those miraculous gifts was to confirm the word. Now you stop and think about that. They didn't have the New Testament in the first century. So how were they to to impart all of this knowledge and all of this, this good news. I heard a debate one time or read about a debate, a guy in woods, and he described it as in the, like building a building. And you know how a building sometimes have scaffolding around it. Well, that's what the signs did. It was kind of like the scaffolding until we could get the scriptures written or until the apostles could, and the disciples could write the scriptures. It was kind of like the scaffolding. Once you had the scriptures written, then you don't need the scaffolding anymore. You don't need the confirming signs. And that harmonizes with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10. that says, when that which is perfect has come, then some of those spiritual gifts are going to go away. So where Jude, Jude 3 says, the faith that was once delivered for all, and as Paul would tell Timothy, to give dil diligence, rightly dividing the word. Why? Because it's given and it's sufficient to equip us for every good work. Amen. Our thanks to Guyton and Troy, and our thanks to you for joining us for another edition of Good News Today. World, always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. There is good news, good news, good news the world. always good news, good news, good news, good news, good news there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.